man, my name is Elder Farnsworth, this is Elder Davis, and we're missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We've come to share a special message with you about Christ. Oh, I'm not a member of your church. I'm a member of an evangelical church, and I'm already saved. We're sharing the message of the Book of Mormon, and that Jesus Christ actually visited the people in the Americas. We know the Book of Mormon is true. Oh, I believe Jesus is my friend. He's my savior, and he's my healer, but he's not my brother. We believe the Book of Mormon to be another testament of Jesus Christ. Oh, I believe in the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, all one. We believe that through the Holy Ghost, you can know the truth of these things. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe God has restored his priesthood to the earth through Peter, James, and John. It says in Ephesians that we are saved by grace alone and not works. We believe faith without works is dead. When it comes to religious conversations, it seems like we all have something to say, but very few of us know how to listen well. This is my friend, Dr. Robert Miller at Brigham Young University, and I'm Pastor Greg Johnson with Standing Together Ministries. In contrast to what we just saw, Greg Johnson and I have been working to establish the kind of relationship that's characterized by our friend Richard Mao as convicted civility. The Apostle Peter reminds us that as believers we need to have an answer for the hope that lies within us, but we're to do so with gentleness and respect. There are many people in this world who are very convicted, convinced of their own faith, and there are many people who are civil, but there are not many people who are both convicted and civil. We're asked if it's not some sort of compromise between us, some, some ecumenical activity of minimizing the differences between Mormons and evangelicals. Quite the contrary, convicted civility allows us to own our convictions and at the same time be gracious and respectful to one another in discussing the differences and the similarities between our two faiths. When a person doesn't have convicted civility, he is prone to think and act in extremes. For example, uh, before I left on a full-time mission, I remember asking my father, who had also been raised in the LDS faith, Dad, what does it mean to be saved by grace? And my dad, who really had a pretty good knowledge of the gospel, answered, we don't believe in that. I said, we don't believe in it? He said, no, son. I said, why don't we believe in it? He said, because the Baptists do. Bob and I are actually often asked how we met one another, and I can remember when we met in April of 1997, a professor from Denver Seminary came to Brigham Young University to speak. Uh, when the meeting was over, Greg and I shook hands, met. And he invited me into his office, and the next thing I knew, I was looking at shelves of evangelical books by evangelical authors that I knew very well. I was really surprised. I said, Bob, why do you have all these evangelical writers? And he says, you know, I really enjoy uh, what they have to say, and I've learned a lot. And, and I just thought at that point, boy, this would be a guy I'd really like to get to know. Greg and I began to talk by having lunch together every month, every other month, he would ask me questions, I would ask him questions. We would explore similarities, we would explore differences. We did that for some three years or so and it proved to be a very fruitful exchange. There was an interesting point when we wondered if the relationship could continue. We sat outside of uh, my church office in a car as we'd just come back from lunch. There was kind of almost a sadness really there, and, and kind of wondering if, if this thing had uh, a, a future to it, this friendship, this relationship, this conversation. And we both agreed that we didn't have any particular agenda for this relationship, but I think we made one of the most important decisions of this entire relationship, and that was we decided we would leave the event with God. And if God had something for Greg Johnson to do, he would let him know. And if God had a place he wanted Bob Millett to be, he'd put Bob Millett there. As our relationship grew, I began to sense a feeling of responsibility toward my evangelical friends. I remember as a professor standing before a class of about 150, when one of my students, rather offhand, made a comment uh, that wasn't very uh, complimentary of evangelical theology. Oh, you know how those born-againers are. They believe you, you confess Christ and do anything you want after that. And I remember feeling, I just can't let this pass. Historically, uh, I think it's known to everybody that Mormons and evangelicals have uh, operated in the spirit of antagonism. And we both take the Great Commission very seriously, so we're, we're historically driven to try to convert one another to our own understanding of faith. You know, I think a, an illustration of this is when a faculty friend of Bob's took me to lunch one time. He asked me the question, did I think that I was going to convert Bob Millett? And I said, well, I, I don't think so. And he said, well, I hope you, you don't think you can because he's the dean of our religion faculty. And I said, oh, I understand. And he said, well, well, then are you interested in converting to the Mormon faith? And I said, no, I, I'm not thinking that way either. And he said, uh, 
well, I don't get it. What's the point? And I remember I just looked at him and I said, I think you're the point. Because people like you have got to change your thinking that it's not just about converting one another, but it's about building relationships that allow us to open our hearts to one another and, and allow God to use us to influence one another. If someone had told me seven years ago as Greg Johnson and I sat in the car wondering where this was all going, that many of the magnificent things that have happened would come to pass, I think both of us would have shaken our head. We've witnessed not only a friendship between two people grow, but we've witnessed it expand to include many evangelical scholars and Latter-day Saint thinkers coming together twice a year to, to talk and to listen and to learn from one another. We've witnessed it in terms of young people from evangelical schools coming to Brigham Young University to visit with BYU students, to develop relationships of trust. One of the evangelical students asked the Mormon group, when you hear the term evangelical Christian, what's the first thing that comes to mind? And after a pause, someone asked, how honest do you want us to be? And they said, please be honest. And so then the Mormon students began to answer by saying, well, we know that you think we're a part of a cult or that we're not even Christians. And you could just hear one after another these stories of painful experiences. And then a Mormon student asked the evangelical, well, what about when you hear the term Mormon church, what do you think? And after that pause, they asked, how honest do you want us to be? And they said, be honest. And then the evangelical said, well, we know that your uh, first vision says that our creeds are an abomination to God and that you're the only true church. And as I listened to them share very honestly these painful stories of interaction, I really felt that they were beginning to understand that in sharing of this nature, you begin by hearing each other's pain and really recognizing that. And, uh, and I think those students realized that day, you know, we can do this better than we've done it in the past. Some other byproducts of this amazing relationship were that the first presidency of the LDS Church permitted Rabbi Zacharias to speak in the Mormon Tabernacle on Temple Square. And over 7,000 people, Latter-day Saints and Evangelicals, came out to hear Rabbi speak about the person and work of Jesus Christ. On a more personal level, you know, uh, many times at general conferences of the LDS Church, there are folks that are known as street preachers who come out to denounce the Mormon church and the Mormon doctrine. There was such a concern about this that in the evangelical community here in Salt Lake, many churches gathered to participate in something called Mission Loving Kindness, where we literally stood on the streets of North Temple to express love and kindness and to pray for the Mormon people in opposition to or in contrast to this, uh, this spirit of hostility. And the response of the LDS people was amazing as they felt uh, that this had never happened before. Getting to know another person, what their faith is, what they feel deep down, is not easy. Uh, Dean Christer Stendhal of the Harvard Divinity School once observed that if you really want to know what a person feels, what they believe, he said, I have three suggestions. One, go to an active, practicing, somewhat knowledgeable member of that faith. Ask them. Two, he said, if you must compare, compare their best with your best. And three, he said, always leave room for holy envy. You know, Bob and I both are very committed to our pursuit of truth and what we believe to be the truth. But we also agree very much with John Stackhouse, who said well, that winning an argument is not as important as winning a friendship. And that's a great principle if you think about it. Sometimes we're so determined to win the argument that we lose the friendship in the process. If we would have started this association a long time ago and just had an argument, that relationship would have ended that day. But because we were pursuing a friendship, so much more has been able to happen.